Ladies and gentlemen, the Mount Zion Church of Christ of Savannah, Tennessee presents Declaring the Gospel, brought to you in the interest of New Testament Christianity in the 21st century. Now here's your speaker, Gilbert Goff, the preacher of the Mount Zion Church of Christ. Hello, my name is Gilbert Goff. I'm the preacher of the Mount Zion Church of Christ. Thank you for watching the Declaring the Gospel television broadcast this week. We're so happy that you've tuned in, and we hope that you will make this a weekly habit to study the Bible with us through this means of television and the Internet. We're on the Internet now, and you can watch this very program on the Internet. I also would like to cordially invite you to come and be with us at the Mount Zion Church of Christ whenever you can. Our building is not hard to find, for we're just located six miles south of Savannah, Tennessee, just off of Highway 128 at Sunset Road, and we'd be on the right. Now, if you're coming from the Pickwick Dam area, just as you cross over Pickwick Dam, look at your odometer and mark four and a half miles, and then you will see our building on Highway 128 going north, and it'll be on the left. Come if you can. We meet every Sunday morning at 9.30 for Bible study. We have classes for all ages. At 10.30, we'll gather together for morning worship, where we will sing and pray and partake of the Lord's Supper, give of our means, and study God's Word through the preaching of the Gospel. We will assemble again on Sunday evening at 5 p.m. for another period of worship, in which I'll be preaching again at that time. We have midweek Bible study on Wednesday evenings at 7 p.m., in which we again divide up into Bible classes for all ages. We would love to have you come and be with us. I can assure you that when you walk in the door of the church building, that you're going to be greeted by some very friendly people, and those people are going to make you feel like a welcome guest. And we hope that you'll come and take advantage of that. But also, let me take this opportunity to introduce you to the Mount Zion Church of Christ website which is Mount Zion, M-T-Z-I-O-N, C-H-O-F-Christ.org. Write that down. And on this website, you can watch this Declaring the Gospel television program and others that we have uploaded whenever you want to, just by tapping on the link. Uh, I think there's a little television screen there. You tap on that, and it will take you to all the various programs that we have uploaded. It takes you immediately to our YouTube channel, and there you can watch, like I said, this program or any that we've uploaded. We even have some Bible articles on there on the website for your study, and we're continuing to build that website, so check it further and check it often. I think you'll enjoy our website. Now, in this program today, I'm going to be answering a question that relates directly to the salvation of our souls in our Bible question and a Bible answer section. Now, the question for our program today is about a great subject, God's grace. And the question is twofold. What is grace and what is grace not? So then following our Bible question, Bible answer section, we're going to have a lesson today on what the church is not. So I've been dealing with what the church is the last few weeks. Now today at our Bible lesson, we'll be talking about what the church is not. So let's get into our Bible question and Bible answer section right now. God's grace, what is it and what is it not? Now grace, as it is taught in the Bible, refers to God's favor. Favor which men do not deserve and cannot merit. Now, I'm going to tell you, few subjects are more widely misunderstood or perverted as is God's grace in the Bible. So it's an imperative that we understand this Bible doctrine. For our very salvation depends upon understanding God's grace. So to answer our question, some contrast I think would be helpful for us to see of what grace is and what grace is not. First, grace does not rule out conditions. It is true that Christians are justified freely by His grace, Romans 3, 24. God did not owe us a favor, and we could not even earn His favor. That grace that God gives is free. However, that does not mean it's cheap. 
That is without conditions for receiving it or remaining in it. If grace were unconditional, then all would be saved. For God so desires, according to 1 Timothy 2, 6, that all men be saved. But we know they will not be. For in Matthew chapter 7 and verse 13, the Bible says, Enter ye in at the straight gate. For wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. And many there be which go in thereat. Grace is no less free because it is conditional or has requirements to receive it. For example, we offer a free Bible correspondence course to all of our viewers. It is absolutely free. It will cost you not one single penny. However, to, re to freely receive the Bible correspondence course, it comes with a condition. You must contact us by writing or calling us in order to receive it. Now, because a condition is attached, does it make the Bible Correspondence Course any less free? Of course not. That is the way of God's grace. It is free, but in order to receive it, there are conditions to be obeyed. Next, grace does not eliminate law. Grace and law are not mutually exclusive, as many affirm and many assume. If grace excludes law, it also excludes sin. And Romans 4.15 says, For where no law is, there is no transgression. And if there is no law in the presence of grace, there is no need for grace because of the absence of sin. Now, when Paul wrote, for ye are not under the law, but under grace, like in Romans 6.14. Paul was referring to the law of Moses, what the authority of which died with Jesus on the cross and was taken out of the way, Colossians chapter 2 and verse 14. Grace, not the law of Moses, is the basis of salvation. But this fact does not exclude all law. For Paul wrote in Romans chapter 8 and verse 2, for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. Paul also wrote the Galatian churches and said this, Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. The law of Christ, which is the law of the spirit of life, is the condition to obey or to obtain grace and to maintain it. Now, third, grace does not exclude works. As with law, so with our works. The one does not exclude the other. So what did Paul mean when he said, or wrote, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. Now, did he exclude every sort of works? Well, absolutely not. Otherwise, Paul would have contradicted himself when he wrote that faith and oral confession of that faith in Christ must be done for salvation, Romans 10, 9 and 10. Paul would have contradicted himself when he commanded that men should repent everywhere, Acts 17, 30, and that men should be baptized to uh, walk in a newness of life, Romans 6, 3, and 4, to put on Christ, Galatians 3, 27. All of these are involving human actions, human works, and they're necessary to salvation. They're conditions, they're laws, they're works of God, they're works of righteousness that God requires of us to be in His grace. You see, the works of Ephesians 2, which men can boast about, is something where men think they can earn God's grace. But you can't earn God's grace by your own merit. But you can while you're obeying the conditions or the obedience to God. None can work hard enough or long enough to deserve God's grace. The availing principle in Christ is faith which worketh by love, Galatians 5 and verse 6. Now, last of all, grace does, it does not equal license to sin. God's grace brings liberty and freedom from sin, and we have a liberty in Christ Jesus, and we are to stand fast, therefore, in the liberty where Christ has made us free, Galatians 2 and verse 4. Now, some interpret grace, therefore, to be a ticket to behave as they please. They turn the grace of God into lasciviousness, like some did in Jude 4. 
using their freedom for an occasion of the flesh. Galatians 5.13 Now those who fall, thus fall from grace, will be lost eternally, according to Galatians 5 and verse 4. Brethren, friends, think on these things. Grace is so important that we understand that in order to obtain it, in order to be, maintain it, to live in it, we have to be obedient to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And because God has conditions, laws, or commandments to be obeyed, does not negate from the favor of God. Not at all. In fact, the system of grace is a system of commandments that men must obey in order to be saved. That's not work salvation based upon human merit. It is the works of God. Even faith itself is a work of God. And so is repentance, and so is confession, and so is baptism for the remission of one's sins. I want to thank you for listening. And now, we'll go into our Bible study in just a moment. At this time, the Mount Zion Church of Christ would like to extend an offer of a free 25-lesson Bible correspondence course to any and all of our viewers of the Declaring the Gospel television broadcast. Twenty-five Bible subjects are covered that will be a challenge to you and your study of God's Word. This course, if you choose to enroll, costs you nothing. It is free to you upon the condition that you write us or call us, give us your name and address, and when upon reception of your first lessons, you will get your Bible and study the lessons at your convenience. When you have finished studying the lessons and answered the questions, drop them back in the mail to us in a self-addressed envelope, which we provide. When we receive the lessons, we will grade them and return them to you with more lessons. To receive the free Bible Correspondence Course, write to us at this address, Mount Zion Church of Christ, 5905 Highway 128, Savannah, Tennessee, 38372, or call us at this number. 731-925-3423. We will send it out to you right away. It is time now for our Bible study. Well, I hope that you will enroll in the free Bible correspondence course, and also I hope that you've enjoyed our program up to this point, and I appreciate you watching the Declaring the Gospel television broadcast. Now today, we're going to continue our study about the church. For the past few weeks, we've been talking about how to distinguish the church through the metaphorical descriptions of the Bible. We're establishing the fact that Jesus came to this earth and only built one church, just as He promised in Matthew 16 and verse 18. Upon this rock I'll build my church. We're encouraging men and women to obey the gospel and enter into that one church so that they may be numbered with the saved. Acts 2 and verse 47, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved, or literally as such as were being saved. So we want people to be saved. Now the church is the body of Christ. It is the kingdom of Christ. It is the house or the family of God. And so as we were looking at the church and uh, distinguishing it, and every time that the Bible describes the church by a metaphor, like a body, a kingdom, a house, it's always singular. It's never plural. Denominationalism is something that is called a Johnny-come-lately. In other words, denominationalism came long after the church was well established on the day of Pentecost, found in Acts chapter 2. And that church grew and developed throughout the first century, and it wasn't until men started departing from the faith that denominationalism ever existed. And people have been deceived by denominationalism for generations now. And it's time for people to go back to the Bible, go back to the book, and that's what we're striving to emphasize, that people should go back to the Bible and learn about the one church. When you see its distinguishing elements, enter into that church because it, it can be identified in the Word of God. I want to emphasize today, as we've been talking about what the church is in the last few weeks, I want to emphasize today what the church is not. I want to emphasize to you, first of all, that the church of Christ is not a man-made institution. The church of Christ didn't originate with man. It originated in the mind of God. 
In fact, it was a part of the very eternal purpose of God. If you were to read the book of Ephesians, the Apostle Paul, one of his major themes of that great epistle is to emphasize the oneness nature of the church, that there is one church. And in the course of that discussion of the church in Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 10 and verse 11, he makes an interesting comment about the church. He says, to the intent that now unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be made known by the church the manifold wisdom of God. Now watch, according to his eternal purpose, which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord. The church was a part of the manifold wisdom of God, planned and purpose in the eternal mind of God. And therefore, folks, the church is not man-made. It was in the mind of God before the foundations of the world, before the world was ever created. God had knew that there had to be a development of a uh, church of which he would have the save enter into. And obviously, Paul makes it very clear that it can't be something man-made if this was in the eternal purpose of God, that is, to establish his kingdom called the church by Jesus Christ. You know, even back in the Old Testament, in the book of Isaiah, the old prophet of old made it very clear that God was going to establish a kingdom, a church. And if you turn to Isaiah chapter 2, verse 2 and verse 3, the Bible says that it shall come to pass in the last days, in the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains, and shall be exalted above the hills, and all nations shall flow unto it. And many people shall go and say, Come ye, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of God of Jacob, and he will teach us of our ways, of his ways. And we will walk in his paths, for out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Now this prophecy is a beautiful description of exactly what happened in Acts chapter 2 when the church began, when the Holy Spirit was outpoured upon the, on the apostles. They got stood up and spoke with tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. As they were speaking those tongues, they were preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, convicting men of sin, and men repented and were baptized and entered into the church, and they were numbered with the saved. And obviously, these are people from all different nations. These are people that flowed into the house of God. They're the one that we talked about last week, that the house of God is the church of God, the church of the living God. And as we have established this fact, notice that there is nothing about being man-made. This is something that God had in his eternal purpose and plan for mankind. It was a part of prophecy, and 750 years before the prophecy was ever, when the prophecy was made, it's being fulfilled 750 years later in, the, in Jerusalem on Mount Zion, and people flowed into it just as the prophet predicted that it would. So folks, there is only one church, and it is not something man-made. It is something that originated with God. Sometimes we're charged with the fact, well, the church of Christ began with Alexander Campbell. And folks, that is a devil's lie and has been for years. The church of Christ has never claimed that uh, the church began by Alexander Campbell. We've always exclaimed, we've declared with all the... Um, in a, a vigor that we could possibly muster, that we, the church, began in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost, following our Lord's resurrection, recorded in Acts chapter 2 in fulfillment of prophecy and a part of the eternal purpose of God. The church is not man-made. Christ had to die to make the church possible. And when you turn to Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 7, the Apostle Paul tells the church in Ephesus, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. So it's through Christ the church was forgiven and had found redemption. In Acts chapter 20 and verse 28, when the Apostle Paul met with the elders of the church at Ephesus in the city of Miletus, we know that he said, Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock, and there the church is described as a flock, and notice that it is singular, to, uh, to all the flock over which the Holy Spirit hath made you overseers, uh, to feed the church of God, notice church singular, which he hath purchased with his own blood. Jesus paid the price for the church. Now that's not man-made, that is God-devised. 
That is a part of God's plan to save man through the death of Jesus Christ. And then by that shed blood, he would establish the church because those who are in the church are going to be redeemed by the blood of his son. Notice also in Ephesians chapter 1 uh, and, and verse 22 and verse 23. The Apostle Paul makes it clear that the church is a divine institution when he says that God hath put all things under his, Christ's feet, and gave him, Christ, to be head over all to the church, which is his body that filleth the all in all. Notice that the church is described as the body that the Christ is the head of. Now, folks, that's a divine institution. That's not something man made. It's not something that man devised. That was part of the plan of God. We turn to like in Ephesians chapter uh, 5, verse 29 and verse 30. When Paul's making a comparison between the husband and a wife relationship, he compares Christ and the church relationship. And he says, for no man ever yet hateth his own flesh but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord, the church, for we are members of his body and of his flesh and of his bones. Again, notice the picture that the church that Jesus bled and died for is the body of Christ. It is his flesh and his bones. It is the way that the gospel is to be spread through the body of Jesus Christ, the church. In Hebrews chapter 12, And verse 22 and verse 23, the Hebrew writer Paul says, but ye are come to Mount Zion. Now remember from Isaiah 2 that the law of the Lord was going to begin and go out from Mount Zion, which is, of course, Jerusalem is built on Mount Zion. And he says, well, ye have come to Mount Zion unto the the city of the living God. Now here the church is pictured as a city. And, And notice it's singular. The heavenly Jerusalem and the innumerable company of angels to the general assembly and the church of the firstborn which are in heaven and to God the judge of all and to the spirits of just men made perfect. Here you have a picture of the church. This is not something that God, man has devised. Now man has devised many denominations through the years. As you can go back and it's very easy to go into religious history books And you can see where all these different denominations begin. You can find out their denominational founders. You can identify these denominations with all their false doctrines that they have devised, how they departed from the Word of God. But if you want to go back and be a part of the church that Jesus built, and you want to be a part of the church that is under Jesus' law, the law of Christ, because every kingdom has a law, and Christ has a kingdom, and it has a law. It's called the gospel. That's what we live by, and that's what we are saved by, that same gospel. And if you want to be a part of that, then you need to enter into the church that you can identify in the New Testament and see restored today, uh, just according to the New Testament pattern, that, my friends, is the church of Christ. And that's what you need to do. Now, I know there are apostate churches of Christ. Those that have departed from the faith and have gone after the false doctrines of men and the ways of men, now they are not faithful to the Lord. It's hard sometimes to find faithful congregations anymore because we're in a state of apostasy. The the world is leaving and departing from God's ways. But Mount Zion Church of Christ, where I'm the preacher, we are determined, our elders, the deacons of this congregation, the brethren who are members of this congregation, are determined to follow God's perfect plan. We want to follow God's ways and we're not interested in the ways of men because the church is a divine institution. It has its divine leader in Jesus Christ. It is to him whom we turn to find authority for all that we do, Colossians 3.17, whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus. I want to emphasize today with all within me, that the church of Christ is not a man-made institution and it is not equivalent with any other denomination because we are not a denomination. We are simply the church that you read about in the New Testament because we're doing it according to a New Testament pattern. If that's what you long for, if that's what you want, and you want to be a number with the church that are, are comprised of the saved, then it's time for you to repent of your sins, to confess your faith in Christ, and be baptized, and that's the means by which you are added unto Christ and into His church. 
And when you have done that, you come to Mount Zion Church of Christ, we'll assist you in your obedience to the gospel by in repentance and confession of your faith in Christ and baptism for the remission of your sins. And then you'll be added to Christ and into his church. You're not joining the church, you're added to the church because you have complied with the commandments of God to believe, repent, confess, and be baptized. If we can assist you in your obedience to the gospel, to be a part of a, not a man-made denomination calling itself a church, but to be a part of the church that you read about in the New Testament. And if you find that we're teaching something that's not in harmony with the New Testament, you let us know because we want to do what the Bible teaches. I'm not interested in what man thinks. You tell me what God thinks and we'll follow that if we're in error. You know, folks, if there's any time that you have any questions or comments or even criticisms of anything that we've said in this broadcast, be sure to send those to, those to us or call us and let us know. We'll answer them in our Bible question, Bible answer section. That's really what it's designed for. Or we may even preach a sermon on it. So if we can assist you in your obedience to the gospel, come and be with us at the Mount Zion Church of Christ. Thank you for watching, and may God bless you in the study of His Word.